So, uh, back to it. We were talking about theories and maps. Um, and what I was saying is that, uh, all right, we have different kinds of maps we can draw of the same terrain, right? So that elevation map, that population density map, etc., are all of the exact same space. Um, and what, it, um, what that metaphor of a map gives us is a reminder that theory operates much the same way. It's not always like this theory is quote-unquote right or true and this other theory isn't. Instead, we need to think about what it is that we want to use that map for. So, right, a population density map might be more interesting to someone who's thinking about opening a business, for example, whereas an elevation map uh, would be more interesting to maybe a geologist or an airplane pilot, for example. Neither of those maps is right and the other is wrong. Uh, we're interested in really the practical utility of that map to tell us how valuable it is. Now, we're going to talk about theories in here and the ways that theories do four specific things for us, much like a map should as well. The first thing a theory needs to do for us is describe. And when we talk about describe, what we're really talking about is what, right? What something is. Some of the theories we're going to talk about in here are going to tell us what communication is, much like a map would tell us what something is, what those landmarks are, for example, right? Theories are also supposed to do something different for us. They're also supposed to explain. When we talk about explain, we're talking about why, right? It digs a little bit deeper into something. So, for example, a, a map might do more than simply tell us what the landmarks are, right? It might answer some fundamental questions about why Spartanburg is the way that it is, right? Why certain population migrations happen in this way, or why this always this area of town always seems to be congested with traffic, for example. Um, theories are supposed to do the same thing for us as well. Maybe not just tell us what communication is, but also tell us why we communicate, right? What are our motivations, right? What are the things that, that make us communicate in the way that we do? Maps also help us predict, right? Maps can help us predict where a population boom might happen, right? Um, or it can help us predict, well, okay, if we put a stoplight here, it might, flow, it might slow this congestion down. Similarly, theory should do something similar for us. It should tell us if we're put in certain situations, are we, how are we likely to act? How are we likely to communicate in those situations? And finally, control, right? This involves uh, manipulating the environment. So if you're a city planner, right, you might be able to tell, okay, if this, I can predict if I put a traffic light here, it'll, it'll affect congestion of traffic in this way, and then you control it by actually doing it. Or that business owner who might be interested in a demographic map, right, um, would say, okay, we can control this environment by actually putting my business here instead of there. Similarly, theory should help us have some practical utility by letting us control our own communicative abilities, right? And we use these criteria to theorize experience of everyday life. We talked about that last lecture when we said theory is something we engage in our everyday lives. It's not something that's abstract and out there, right? So you could do something like talk about a theory about why it is you dress a certain way for a job interview, right? So kind of in the what, the description level, you would say, Oh, okay, I know that I'm supposed to wear nice clothes to a job interview because I... Um, uh, I see other people doing it, so on the what level, I know I need to wear a suit and tie, for example. I can explain why I need to do that, because I know that I'll be taken more seriously if I actually uh, right, dress up nice for the job interview. I can predict that I have a better job, I have a better um, uh, opportunity, right? Better odds of getting that job if I dress this way. So I control it, right? I go down and I buy a suit even if I don't really feel like spending $200 on one. You do it and you manipulate your environment to give yourself the best odds you have for that job interview. Right there what we've done is rudimentary theory, right? And it's not something that's, that's out there necessarily. It's something that we live in our everyday lives and we don't consciously sit down and think through these four functions. But theory is something that we, that we just kind of intuitively do. Now, at this point, it's important to draw a distinction between two different kinds of theories here, right? We have objectivist and we have interpretive approaches to theory. Every theory in here is going to come from one of these traditions. Now, I don't want these to necessarily sound like it's a hard and fast line. If you look at the, at the front of any chapter in your Griffin book, you'll see that there's a scale up there where some theories are more objective and some are more interpretive. Let's talk through what these are. We're going to start with objective theory. 
Objective theory is concerned with truth. And I put truth there in a capital T way. What objective theory is interested in doing is getting to the truth. A mirror, right? It's supposed to be a mirror of the way that things actually are. The way that objectivity tries to do this is that it tries to establish cause and effect. Object, objective theories are all kinds of concerned with cause and effect. We want to know why, what makes this other thing happen, right? Um, and it's high on the explanation and predictability. Now, the way that we try to establish cause and effect is usually by controlling our variables within objective theory. So, for example, um, the kind of thing that if I were to be interested in understanding communication uh, to my students and wondering if face-to-face -face or, uh, I guess, this cybernetic um, computer-mediated communication is going to be more effective for helping my students retain information, right? What I could do is I would set up some kind of an experiment where I would control my variable. Now, I couldn't just automatically assume, right, if I were to test you versus my in-person class, I wouldn't necessarily know that it's the computer-mediated communication or the face-to-face -face communication that's affecting your retention of information, because there's a bunch of different stuff there, right? What if um, my computer, or what if my online class just happens to be smarter, right? What if they're all seniors and my other class is all, all sophomores? Well, presumably, seniors would be better at retaining the information. What if it has to do with the time of day that people are accessing the information, right? What if my online students do it first thing in the morning when they're good and fresh, and, right? And my other class is a night class, a three-hour night class, for example, right? What if these are as variables? What if one class is, is mixed and another is, um, is only um, one gender of student, for example? These are all variables that are going to affect your retention level of the information. Now, if I wanted to test this, right, in an objective theory kind of way, I need to control for those variables. I need to make sure it's relatively the same population of students. Now, we do this all the time, right? So, the other day, my DVD player wasn't working, and the first thing I did, um, right, is I got out another DVD, and I put it in the DVD player, and, right, I tried to play it. What I'm doing there is I'm controlling my variables. I want to know if there's something wrong with my DVD player, right, which is making me not be able to watch a DVD, or if there's something wrong with the DVD itself. That's a cause-effect relationship that I'm trying to establish there. What objective theories are always trying to do is, is to take what's complicated and boil it down to cause and effect, simple cause and effect. We take what's complicated and we're trying to make it simple. And so objective theory really understands the world through this idea of putting a puzzle together, right? So the truth is out there, and the job of objective theory is to mirror that truth. Now, by mirroring that truth, right, we keep putting pieces in the puzzle, and we get a little bit more, a little bit more. And presumably, according to this logic, there is a way that theoretically we could know everything, right? And so the more puzzle pieces we get in, the more of that, of the big picture that we're all fitting together. Objective theories build on each other. So one objective theory will find something, right, and then another, another uh, scientist will, will come along and build off of that because that's already been established. Now these require validation and experimentation to actually make this, uh, make this happen. And we often talk about quantitative data. Quantitative data is generated from objective theories. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut this lecture here because once again there are a 10 minute time limit here and I don't want to start talking about interpretive theory only to be cut off here in 50 seconds or so. So I'll be right back for part three in what should be the final part of this first lecture.